In Ecuador, a court sentenced to 34 years and 8 months in prison to former police person Germán Cáceres for the femicide of his wife, the lawyer Maria Belén Bernal, murdered in 2022 inside the police high school. Greece authorities reported three people died and 12 remain missing after a boat with 17 asylum seekers sank in the Asian Sea, north of the Greek island of Mykonos. And an armed Israeli settler killed a Palestinian near the town of Ad Dahidria, the southwest of the occupied city of Hebron. Hello from the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba. This is from the south. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada, and these are the news. In Ecuador, a court sentenced on Thursday to 34 years in prison and eight months, the former police person Germán Cáceres for the femicide of his wife, the lawyer Maria Belén Bernal, murdered in 2022 inside the police high school. The magistrates of the Northern Judicial Complex of Quito ruled the maximum aggravated sentence in the Ecuadorian Penal Code against Cáceres for the crime of femicide and imposed a full preparation for Bernal's family of about $260,000. At the same time, the acquitted police person or policeman Alfonso Camacho, who had been charged by the prosecutor's office for an alleged crime of omission. The incident occurred in 2022 in a shock for Ecuadorian society and became a symbol of male violence in the country after Maria Belén was murdered inside a police station. In 2022, 332 women were murdered for gender-related reasons in Ecuador, while so far in 2023, 122 femicides have been registered. In Peru, the death toll from dengue fever rises to 125, while authorities maintain the health emergency in 20 of the 24 departments. This was made known by the Ombudsman's Office while detailing that 95 cases have been confirmed and another 30 are under investigation. They also stated that as of May 24th, more than 101,000 people have been infected nationwide and another 1,277 people have been hospitalized. The the Department of Lambayeque has reported the highest number of deaths, with 28, which is why the Ministry of Health decreed a state of health emergency on May the 10th. And anti-narcotics officers seized 58 kilograms of cocaine, which were handed for Belgium in packages bearing Nazi symbols and the name of Hitler. According to the Peruvian police, the drugs were hidden in 50 packages of the hidden in 50 packages of the size of bricks, each one bearing a Nazi swastika, and some with the word Hitler written in high relief in the compacted white powder. The drugs were found in a Liberian flags boat in the small northern port of Paita, close to the border with Ecuador. The boat had come from Guayaquil, the Ecuadorian port city known as a major jumping off point for South American drugs, heading to the United United States and Europe. On Thursday, Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro Moros launched the Andes 2023 Task Force. In this regard, after weeks of extreme heat, the President said that the Venezuelan state is working on prevention to deal with the effects of climate change and the arrival of the first of almost 65 tropical waves forecast for 2023, in addition to the th the throw that hit last weekend. The head of state reaffirmed that protecting the community is the main mission of his government. On Wednesday, the mixed commission within the Brazilian Congress approved a proposal to reshuffle the Ministry of Environment and Indigenous Peoples. The commission was set up to discuss a provisional measure to create the structure of ministries in the government of Lula da Silva. The lawmakers who drafted the bill proposed relevant changes which will have to go through the plenary of both chambers of the legislature. The changes include exempting responsibility for the recognition and demarcation of indigenous lands from the Ministry of Indigenous Peoples and the responsibility for the rural environmental registry from the Ministry of the Environment.
In Argentina, on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the assumption of power by Nestor Kirchner, the Vice President, Cristina Fernández, proposed the structural axis for a new government. The renewal of the Democratic Party and the pact, as well as a political solution to the debt with the IMF inherited from Macrismo. During the rally, the former president urged to agree on a political solution for a political loan in relation to the IMF credit, which keeps the nation in debt. At the same time, Cristina Fernandez pointed out the need for a renewal of the democratic pact in the country to redefine the functions of the judiciary in order to guarantee accountability. Finally, the vice president of Argentina expressed that despite the differences, the government of Alberto Fernandez has been better than a possible second administration of Mauricio Macri. Despite the mistakes, errors, or differences, this government is infinitely better than the one that would have been another of my recent Macri. I have no doubts. I have no doubts. And Cristina Fernandez questioned the privatization policies of governments that are in possession of the foreign debt. If everything was in the hands of the private sector, if everything was in the hands of the managers, why did Argentina owe so much money? For a very simple reason, because they had gone into foreign debt, because they had nationalized it. In 1982, because they continued to maintain false dollarization through the 90s by indebting the country. The Vice President of Argentina also expressed her support for the decision of Nestor Kirchner and Lula da Silva to cancel the debt of the International Monetary Fund. He also decided, together with Karma Lula da Silva, to pay in cash the debt with the International Monetary Fund. That is, when Argentina and its government voted at the polls, regained the helm of the economy and began the process of reindustrialization. Let's take a short break. But remember, you can join us on TikTok at Tell Us English, where you will find news in different formats, news updates and more. Other studies coming up. Stay with us. Welcome back. On Friday in Greece, authorities reported three people died and 12 remained missing after a boat with 17 asylum seekers sank during the Aegean Sea, north of the Greek island of Mykonos. The Coast Guard confirmed five vessels and three helicopters involved in the search and rescue operations and also said that the bodies of a woman and two other men were found while two men were rescued alive. According to the survivors' testimonies, their boats sank after capsizing and it contained 17 people, among them five women and a seven-year-old child. Greece has been one of the main entry ports into the European Union for refugees and migrants from Africa, Asia and the Middle East. Most cross on inflatable boats from Turkey to outlying Greek islands, a short but perilous journey during which thousands have died. In France, the police repress activists protesting against the shareholders' meeting of the multinational Total Energies. Hundreds of environmental activists tried to blockade on Friday the general shareholders' meeting of the energy giant to protest against the pollution generated by the company and its millionaire profits. In this context, the police repressed with tear gas a group that prevented the access of shareholders to employees to total facilities in the center of Paris. The meeting finally began, albeit belatedly, while the protests continued outside. Total Energy has achieved last year a record profit of $20,526,000,000, 28% more than in 2021.
In Germany, data released on Thursday by the Federal Statistical Office shows Germany's gross domestic product, or the GDP, declined by 0.3% in the period of from January to March. The German economy shrank unexpectedly in the first three months of this year, marking the second quarter of contraction that is one definition of recession. Employment in that country rose to on the first quarter, and inflation has eased, but higher interest rates will keep waging on spending and investment, said Francis Kapolmas, the senior Europe economist for capital economics. The figures are a blow to the German government, which last month badly doubled its growth forecast for this year after a fierce winter energy crunch failed to materialize. The Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan said on Thursday that he and his Azerbaijani counterpart Ilham Aliyev have agreed on mutual recognition of their nation's territorial integrity. The statement was made during the meeting of the Supreme Economic Council of the Eurasian Economic Union held in Moscow. The head of the Armenian executive said his government is ready to unblock all transport and economic corridors with Azerbaijan, while the Azerbaijani leader stressed that those were serious premises for the normalization of relations between the two countries. On the other hand, Russian President Vladimir Putin qualified as important the convergence of the Armenian and Azerbaijani positions on their territorial integrity. And Azerbaijan's President Ilham Aliyev was positive about reaching a possible agreement on other aspects of the peace treaty signed between his country and Armenia on the border conflict in Nagorno Karabakh. I think that after the recent statements of the Armenian leadership of the recognition of Nagorno Karabakh as part of Azerbaijan, as well as the recognition of the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan with the indication of the specific figures for the area of the Republic of Azerbaijan, agreeing on other points of this peace treaty will go on much easier because it was the main factor on which we could not come to an agreement. In the same way, the Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan assured that his country's border services are ready to allow the passage of vehicles from Azerbaijan. Armenian Border Service and Customs Service are ready to ensure the normal passage of all railway vehicles, trains in particular, through the territory of Armenia. And we expect that the Azerbaijani railway will also be open for the cargo of Armenian railway trains. At the end, the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, assured that despite all difficulties, an agreement was reached, which only not benefits these two nations, but also the entire regions. I'm sure that if despite all the difficulties, we achieve a solution to these issues in the end, it will undoubtedly benefit both Armenia and Azerbaijan, and not only the two countries, but also benefit the entire region. On Thursday, while sharing a meeting of the Eurasian Economic Union Council, the Russian President Vladimir Putin said that the Eurasian Economic Union is becoming one of centers of the evolving multipolar world. Note with satisfaction that cooperation within the framework of the Eurasian Union continues to strengthen and our association is consistently asserting itself as one of the independent and self-sufficient centers of the emerging multipolar world. At the same time, the interaction of the five countries is invariably built on the principles of mutual benefit, taking into account the interests of each other and with a focus on ensuring sustainable economic growth and improving the well-being of the inhabitants of all our states. Salasura English continues to grow. You can now tune in from 33 different African countries through Storsat. Dial 461 and enjoy our Latin American alternative broadcast. One final short break and we'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back. 
On Friday, an armed Israeli settler killed a Palestinian near the town of Ad Dahidria, southwest of the occupied city of Hebron. The health ministry confirmed that the victim succumbed to gunshot wounds sustained near the colonial settlement of Tineh Rim, established on land illegally seized by the Israeli state in the southern West Bank. According to Israeli media, the deceased allegedly infiltrated the colonial settlement and attempted to carry out a stabbing attack, although there were no reports of Israeli casualties. In the Hebron governorate, there are 22 Israeli colonial settlements in addition to 15 colonial outposts and four industrial settlements in which some some 21,000 settlers live in violation of international law. In Sierra Leone, a centuries-old tower, towering tree has been felled during a wind and rainstorm in the capital Freetown. The 70-meter, 230-foot Seiba Petandra, lovingly known by Sierra Leoneans as Cotton Tree, lost all of its branches late on Wednesday with only the base of its enormous trunk still standing. It's estimated the tree to be around 400 years old. The president, Julius Marabio, stated that all Sierra Leoneans will pass for thought at the loss of such a prestigious national symbol. There were no reports of injuries, the government said. The police and the military were deployed around the area on Thursday, a report said, and the government announced a cleanup effort was underway. Sierra Leone has suffered several climate-related disasters in recent years, and its rainy season typically lasts from May to October. And in an interview with AFP press agency, the president of Sierra Leone, Julius Marabio, expressed he hopes, he hopes that the conflict between Russia and Ukraine can have a peaceful exit as soon as possible for the good of humanity. Let's listen. We are all suffering as a result of uh, the war in Ukraine. And um, as, as, as uh, global leaders, uh, concern about the welfare of people, especially the poorest of the poor, um, we have a vested interest in seeing to it that that war comes to an end as quickly as possible so that um, the suffering and the, all uh, what is happening there will come to an end, especially as a country that has gone through war before, but also the impact on us. It's uh, for the sake of humanity, uh, for what is happening, you know, uh, let's end the war. There should be, I think we, we, we uh, even those who sympathize uh, with Russia are in favor of stopping this war. And Sierra Leone's president, Julius Marabio, also spoke about his government's domestic objective to eliminate dependence on food imports in difficult times in terms of food sovereignty. We have uh, embarked on a serious policy shift in the Ministry of Agriculture to be able to produce our staple food to the point that we will not need to import rice into this country. I don't want, I don't believe in aid. I believe that we can do enough to develop our own resources. In Sudan, new clashes broke out on Tuesday night between the army and the Rapid Support Forces paramilitary group, despite a week-long ceasefire agreement signed in Saudi Arabia. The ceasefire came into force on Monday to facilitate the delivery and distribution of humanitarian assistance and to restore essential services. However, fighting erupted in and around Khartoum on Tuesday, with both sides issuing statements accusing each other of violating the ceasefire. To this date, the conflict has claimed the lives of 886 through civilians and displays over 1.3 million people. In Zimbabwe, as inflation soars, many Horari residents avoid supermarkets and turn to street stores and hawkers to buy their basic commodities as a result of rising prices and the continued depreciation of the local currency. We buy the tax shop because they are cheap. Their price is not even expensive. Because there, the big shops in these days, they are expensive. Even the rate, their rate is less. At the tax shop, they give us the good rates. That's why we prefer to go and buy the tax shop, because they are cheap. So what we've witnessed over the past few weeks is a massive increase uh, in pricing, uh, Zim dollar pricing. Uh, this has largely been caused by the very significant depreciation of the local currency that we have seen on the black market or on the parallel market and obviously 
uh, in the economy. Of course, we've also seen an increase, a massive increase in government workers' salaries and wages. Again, that has also contributed to increasing liquidity. United uh, Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres welcomed Fulgens Kayishima's arrest on Thursday in South Africa after 20 years of evading justice. Kayishima is accused of being directly responsible for the death of around 2,000 people during the Rwandan genocide. Secretary General welcomes uh, the arrest of uh, Fulgens Kayishima uh, in South Africa, who has been uh, sought since 2001 for allegedly committing genocide and crimes against humanity in Rwanda in 1994, following a warrant for, uh, of his, for his arrest by the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Mr. Kaishima's apprehension sends a powerful message that those who are alleged to have committed such crimes cannot evade justice and will eventually be held accountable even more than a quarter century later. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telluswithenglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Telluswith English, I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.